Ned, I struggle with consciousness. I know you do too. Um, and, and I look for elements that we can understand that, that may have, a, have an input to describe it. And one of the things that some people talk about is language. That we, some say, we can't have real consciousness, we understand it, without language. Uh, and uh, some say that that's no relationship. You have consciousness, and consciousness, in fact, was the thing that created language. Some people say language created consciousness. Uh, is this a fruitful discussion? Yes, language and con the relation between language and consciousness is important. The um, event that established modern neuroscientific consciousness research was a decision by Francis Crick and Christoph Koch to look at non-linguistic animals on the theory that their visual consciousness is pretty similar to ours, and you could study consciousness by studying vision, in animals that didn't have language. Mm, mm. And that has proven enormously fruitful. Those mm. animal studies, which, is, which are you know, the basis of most of what we know now, because they're the only things that you can really you know, do interventions in the, in mm. the brain of a, uh, you know, of, of a really significant sort. Mm. Um, and I think another sort of related distinction that's been important is the distinction between um, consciousness and cognition. Cognition doesn't have to be linguistic. Those non-linguistic animals ha have some cognition. But then there are also animals that seem to have just perception. For example, the jumping spider can identify its prey and track it. Um, it has a, a, a good perceptual system, but probably little or no cognition. So we can think about the, the distinction between perception and cognition looking at these non-linguistic animals and then ask ourselves, what do you have to add to perception to get conscious perception? Mm, mm. And that's been a, a kind of a useful way of thinking about consciousness, I think, and one that, that I think has, the results suggest that, that language is really irrelevant to consciousness. It may intensify consciousness or change its mode, but not is not essential to consciousness. Could it have been the fact that language developed first and then, then consciousness emerged out of that in some way, or do you think that's highly unlikely? That's what, you know, I think some people think that, but uh, no, I, I, I think consciousness is a biological phenomenon that much predated um, language. Uh, I think we, um, we can see consciousness at its purest in, in perceptual consciousness, mm -hmm. and it has nothing to do, with, or little to do with language. And how would you distinguish between the, I guess, the, the four concepts you said, consciousness, language, cognition, and perception? Well, I think the basic distinction is between perception and cognition. We have percepts that can be conceptualized using, um, and that, that was, that's what gets them into the conscious, into the cognitive, cognitive system. So that's the basic, I think the most basic distinction. Um, and then the, um, uh, uh, the language is a, a you know, more advanced uh, uh, form of cognition. Um, that a, a subset? A subset of cognition, because there's certainly non-linguistic cognition right. in, in non-linguistic animals. And, and there is no language without cognition. Yeah, no language without cognition. So right. language yeah. would be a subset of cognition. La language is a subset of cognition. Uh, right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and, and so by distinguishing each of these character, characterizations and, and stripping them out in perception, cognition, language, you know, we're, what, what are we left with in consciousness? Okay, so we purify consciousness. It helps us to understand what it is. Perception is not linguistic in form. It's probably iconic, picture-like. Mm -hmm. um, and so we have to, in investigating it, we have to understand how a picture-like representation could be a conscious representation. Mm -hmm. That's also been quite useful. Mm -hmm. And uh, the examination of each of these pieces, mm -hmm. um, it, 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 how important is that in ultimately trying to understand what consciousness is? Well, I think purifying consciousness to get the most basic core form mm -hmm. is important. And I think this pure perceptual consciousness is probably the right form. Can you have consciousness without perception? Uh, you can certainly have, um, you know, imagery, conscious imagery with your, you know, your eyes closed. Mm -hmm. uh, but that, but those are those have a perceptual those format. Are, those are those are yeah. perceptions. Those are they're 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 
They're like perceptions. They're, they're, yeah, they're yeah. internally generated perceptions, or whatever, yeah. however Something you want to like call that. it. Yeah, yeah. But, but so can you have consciousness without that? Okay, I, mean, I think we don't know. You know, we, one thing we don't know is whether cognition has its own phenomenology, mm -hmm. um, or whether the phenomenology of cognition is entirely perceptual, the words and images. Oh, um, that's, that's very significant. Yeah, the, so that, that's the big divide in people who ask, talk about the phenomenology of cognition. Is, is, it all, is the phenomenology of cognition all the phenomenology of what is sometimes called the clothes of the cognition? Mm -hmm. The words and images right. in which we think, right. Or is there some underlying um, uh, 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 phenomenology of thought that is not those? And if that's the case, that would that would enrich what pure consciousness is. If you could. yes, absolutely. So if we could be satisfy ourselves that there could be pure um, phenomenology of thought, then we would have an additional pure phenomenology to under to try to understand.